Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so thanks uh, for coming to my talk. And I'm going to just uh, share some lessons learned from some recent work on graph frames and building uh, scalable graph algorithms. And a uh, little bit about myself. I'm uh, a software engineer leading the machine learning and uh, data teams at Databricks. I'm also contributing to just a couple of Spark components. Um, today, and uh, we're going to talk about graph frames. And graph frames is a Spark package and uh, Spark is not just a MLlib, GraphX, or just a Spark SQL. Spark is actually an eco ecosystem, and there are about hundreds of Spark packages available on just the sparkpackages.org website. Uh, so this is one of them, and was introduced back in 2016 and by Databricks, uh, UC Berkeley, and MIT. Uh, so you may heard uh, talks about graph frames from Anker, and he's from Berkeley, and also Joseph uh, from Databricks. So you can think about the graph frames as uh, the data frames interface uh, to GraphX. And you know GraphX is using RDDs, and uh, graph frames just use data frames as the interface. And uh, the benefit to uh, GraphFrames users is uh, you can use Python interface, you can use Java, and you can use Scala. They look uh, pretty similar. And, but for GraphX, because we use some advanced Scala features, and it's now very user-friendly to Java users, and there's no P Python API available. And uh, with GraphFrames, we also introduced a very just uh, expressive uh, graph query syntax, and uh, I will show some examples later. And uh, also, well, by using data frames, uh, we can leverage on Spark SQL's query plan optimization and the tungsten, uh, just the tungsten uh, engine support. And we also pop over some algorithms to, from GraphX to graph frames. Uh, let's do some quick examples so you know well, how to use graph frames and in a couple of minutes. And first, it's very easy to just uh, to load the Spark shell uh, with graph frames. You just say dash dash packages, and you will download packages from Maven and from Spark packages. And the recent release is 0.5.0, uh, and uh, you have to pick a Spark version and a Scala version, and that's unnecessary. And if you want to make it simple, and definitely just try the Databricks Community Edition. And it's a free version of our product and that's uh, designed for people who want to learn Spark. And definitely a perfect place to try graph frames. Um, another example I want to give is to do graph queries. And your graph X only handles the batch uh, use case and batch algorithms. And with graph frames, and uh, we can easily say, for example, finding the second degree uh, followers using, using a graph language and not using just the plain map reduce. And for this one, you can see you say, well, find uh, such pattern, such A is following B and from some edge, and then B is following C, and, but A is not following C directly. And then you get a data frame of its column named A, B, C that match the, match the pattern, and then you can do a filter on, for example, I want to filter out myself uh, from the second degree followers, and then we select the second degree followers, and we can continue with other properties. So it's very convenient to use and to do graph search. And you can also do just a graph algorithms, and you only need a, something like a method name and a couple parameters. And it will give you, in this example, you just return the page rank for the graph. Uh, there are a bunch of supported graph algorithms, and um, well, most of them are from uh, GraphX, and so you have seen those uh, algorithm names uh, for quite long. <laughs> and uh, however, uh, we're also moving some of the implementations to data frames. So the initial implementation in graph frames is uh, just to do some simple wrappers around graph X. That means it will give me a graph in graph frames and I just convert it into graph X graph. And then we run the algorithm and convert the data back. So it doesn't receive the benefit from uh, using data frames. You only receive the benefit for the API. But uh, for the implementation for scalability, 
And uh, GraphX uh, doesn't really scale that well because it's RDD based and uh, it's not very uh, optimized for operating on just a, a billions of small objects. It's very easy for you to hit, for example, the, uh, the garbage collection issues and other, other issues. So data frames is kind of optimized for this uh, use case to handle just uh, billions of small objects. And it also have optimized storage and also just constant code generation so just uh, your code can run faster. And you also just can do uh, query plan optimization so you know what, which order you should execute and to just uh, shuffle less data. So we definitely want to move more algorithms to data frames. And um, this is kind of the talk is about the lessons we learned from this uh, first or several tries. Um, yeah, the first question we, we hit is really just uh, getting some ID assignment to the vertices in a graph. And uh, it seems simple, but uh, it took us uh, very long to find it out what's the right way to do it. And uh, why we want to have this uh, integral vertex IDs. And graph frames allow users to put uh, string IDs just for convenience. But in order to implement some graph algorithms, you want to shuffle the ID, uh, vertex IDs around. So you don't want to be, each vertex ID takes about uh, maybe one kilobytes of, map, uh, of data. So you want to convert them, map them into some smaller ones, smaller, simpler uh, data. And uh, sometimes it's just uh, long integers. So and it can help, also help optimize the in-memory storage because usually, well, you don't need the content of the string IDs, right? Just, this is just an identifier. And you can uh, do your graph algorithm and join them back later. So, and you can also just uh, save communication, save several uh, data sites. So, but the task is uh, very simple. It's just uh, you're given some unique vert vertex identifiers and you just assign them to some unique IDs. And um, the first thing we considered is uh, can we use the hashing trick? It's similar to the people, what people use in machine learning, right? So you just uh, given a feature, you apply a hash function, you get a kind of unique uh, long, uh, long value or int value. So for example, those are the names for the graph frames committers. And we just apply a hash function, you got those numbers, and it seems, uh, well, you already get a long integer ID assignment. Um, so this is very easy, but the problem is uh, what if th there's a collision, right? So what if there's uh, two people got assigned the same ID? And uh, you can calculate it with a little bit math, and it's very simple, and uh, this is N is the, oh, it's, uh, there's a typo here. So N is the kind of the hash space you have, and K is the number of uh, elements uh, you want uh, uh, in your graph. And uh, while well, you just calculate this, and if we use long integer range, it seems, uh, well, this range is super, super wide. And uh, it's very unlikely you see this. You see a collision, but this is not true. And uh, you can easily estimate the, the value there. And if you go up to one billion nodes, and the chance is about 5%. So it's not a very small chance uh, of seeing some hash collision. And uh, also, hash collisions are bad for graph algorithms. This is not the same uh, case for doing, for example, logistic regression, and you can hash a value if there's a collision, and it only affects a single record, it doesn't affect the model uh, that much. But this one, if a collision can change the graph topology, and if you're talking about connected components, and uh, which we are going to discuss later, and it will just uh, change the component, number of components, and ch make uh, small components into big ones. And this is definitely what you do not want in graph, uh, in graph algorithms. And so there are other ways to generate uh, unique IDs in Spark. And uh, actually, I implemented a couple of functions here. And uh, for RDD, you can say, well, zip with unique ID. Then for each record, you get a unique ID. Uh, that's a long integer, or you can say zip with index, and then for each record, you get uh, an index from starting from zero and then counting down. And in data frames, you can also just uh, use a UDF called monotonically increasing ID. 
And that's very similar. You just uh, append a new column and to your data frame, and then with some increasing uh, long IDs, and those are all unique. So then, well, it seems uh, very simple to do. And just given a data frame of vertices, and you just say, well, append this new column with the generated long integers, and we get the mapping. And you save the mapping somewhere, and uh, you can use it later. However, we spend a very, just a, very long time to just uh, to make this one work, but it turned out to be it's not that simple. And f let, let me explain this. So first, how it works, and you can see, well, you have uh, RDD or distributed data sets, and you have different partitions, and each partition you have some records. The way we assign the unique ID is uh, for partition one, we start from zero, and then just at zero, one, two, three, assign the ID for the first partition. For the second partition, we start with some, some predefined number, let's say 100, and we start with 100, then 101, and 102, and continue. So as long as each partition uh, doesn't have more than 100 uh, just uh, records, uh, we are good. So in, in practice, we may choose something much bigger than 100, but this is how we get ID assignments in Spark. And, uh, but it, it, it doesn't, uh, just always work. And you know that, uh, well, if you're a Spark user, you definitely know RDDs and data frames, and they are designed to be immutable, and they remember all the just uh, uh, parents and computations, so you can always reproduce the data. So Spark doesn't need to cache the data for each step, and as long as it can recompute, and uh, that's good. But uh, Spark doesn't really guarantee uh, the stable ordering in terms of the records in a data set. So it's usually, well, you say you can reproduce a data set, usually just means a set equality, but it doesn't mean that uh, the same ordering. So if you apply some operations like a join, shuffle, repartition, and the result could be uh, kind of undeterministic in terms of the record ordering. And for example, if you do Currently, partition team is uh, the first record, and Joseph is the second record. And then if you recompute uh, this partition, it's possible to say Joseph appears the first and team appears the second. And then when you generate the integer IDs, and then Joseph actually gets zero. Zero ID, but the team got one. And that will hurt your uh, graph uh, computation because the ID assignment is not deterministic. And caching, you, you can say, well, can I cache my data set? So I always fetch from the cache. And it's also not guaranteed in Spark because uh, the cache the data may got kicked out uh, from the cache or just uh, you may have a node failures and then you need to recompute that partition. So this is not really a, a reliable way to get IDs. And we need to figure out, okay, so how can, I, can we guarantee a stable ordering? This is uh, our implementation in graph frames and in the most recent release. And for the vertices data sets, we first do a hash partitioning. And uh, so at least uh, there's a deterministic mapping from each vertex, vertex to the target partition. And then within, inside that partition, we do a distinct. So we make sure it, one vertex only appears once. And then we order the vertex identifiers within each partition. So now you can guarantee that, okay, so no matter how many times we recompute this data frames or data sets, the ordering is always stable. And after that, we generate this unique integral ID and using, for example, the, the UDF from data frames. This is correct, and, but a little bit expensive. But uh, it seems uh, this is the solution we end up with. And uh, yeah, this is just a small kind of initial step, but uh, it took us a couple, just a, a bit of time to find it out what would be the right solution for this. And the next one, we're going to talk about an algorithm. We moved from RDDs to graph frames. And, uh, and also some license learned here. And the algorithm is connected components. And so the, the problem is very simple. You're given a graph, 
I want to assign each vertex a component ID. So if you have two vertices receive the, the same component ID, and they are definitely connected in the graph, and otherwise they should, be dif they should receive different component IDs. And uh, there are a couple applications for connected components. You heard a talk, you may heard a talk uh, last year from Capital One on how they use connected components to do fraud detection on credit card applications. And there are also clustering algorithms and uh, the connected component itself is usually some fundamental building blocks for other graph algorithms. Um, yep, so, and a simple implementation in uh, Spark or in the MapReduce framework is very, is a, is a very simple. And uh, you first just assign uh, each vertex a unique component ID. It could be just the vertex ID itself because it's already unique and uh, 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 it's a long integer. And then you run uh, uh, in batches until just a convergence. Um, for example, if uh, you look at every vertex, it just uh, talk to its neighbors and say, well, what's your component ID? And then just uh, send me your component IDs and then I pick the smallest and I assign myself to that smallest component ID. So basically you are propagating the smallest component, ID, the component IDs to our neighbors and the neighbors of neighbors. And eventually, well, the connected uh, nodes will receive the same ID. So it's very easy to implement uh, in um, this form for this algorithm, but uh, it may hit a very slow convergence rate uh, if your graph has a large diameter. You can think about if you have a chain graph, just uh, one uh, followed by uh, the, the next one. And uh, it takes about uh, very long if you have a, just a, for the information propagated from one side to the other end. And yeah, we look at, uh, do some literature, uh, just a review and found out a paper from Google and this is named a uh, small and large star algorithm for connected components. And it's a very good paper. And uh, they propose the following algorithm. And it's also very simple to read but it's not easy to see well, why it's work, it works. So first you still assign each vertex a unique ID and then you do this uh, so-called uh, small star uh, operation Basically, you look at the neighbors, you connect, reconstruct the local graph. You connect its smaller neighbors and uh, to the smallest neighbor vertex within the neighborhood. And then you do uh, a batch on um, big star operations, and this is to connect its uh, bigger neighbors to the smallest neighbors within the neighborhood. So basically you update your graph and you change the edges and, but still you maintain certain, uh, you maintain the connectivity until you converge to, uh, to a very simple graph. And uh, we can see an example. This is a uh, copy from the paper. And you have a local graph. This is a lo neighborhood of uh, node eight. And you have one, five, seven, nine. And if you want to do the small star operation, it basically it connect, reconnect the smaller nodes to the smallest one. So eight is connected to one because one is the smallest, and five connect to one, seven connect to one. But nine is uh, just uh, you disconnect in this batch. And, uh, but uh, you, then you go to, for example, node nine and to do the small star operation, and node nine will say, okay, eight is the smallest neighbor in my neighborhood, I want to keep that connection. So you don't really lose any connection in this small star operations. And for big star, and it's also simple, for the neighborhood, you look at the bigger uh, neighbor, neighbors, and then you connect them to the smallest one in the neighborhood. And that's called a big star operation. And initially, when I read the paper, I found it uh, not super easy to understand. <laughs> especially on well, why it works. I, I did another interpretation for this. Is basically you can map a graph into a existence matrix. And by the way, my background is uh, linear algebra. That's why I, I love matrices. Um, so you can map it to a existence matrix. So you can see you, one is connected to eight, five is connected to eight, seven to eight, and the eight is connected to nine. We only look at the upper triangular part of this matrix. 
And if when you do a small star operation, and it actually it appears on this matrix to be you shift a block and the column uh, belong to just uh, node eight, and find out the highest uh, just uh, non-zero in this matrix, and then you shift the bottom part and uh, rotate them and then lift them up to the corresponding row. And that's it. And uh, it's very easy to see, well, it doesn't break any connectivity because everything is used to be connected to eight, now it's connected to eight uh, through node one. So this is the small star operation. And then for the big star operation, uh, you look at the row. Uh, because you're looking at the bigger, you want to find the bigger neighbors. You look at the row number uh, corresponding to uh, vertex eight. And then you still look at the highest, uh, just the ele non-zero elements in column uh, just belonging to the vertex number eight. And then you lift it up to, to the corresponding row. And this also just is very easy to see. It doesn't change the connectivity. And eventually, because you're always pushing some elements up, you eventually end up with all the elements on the same row, on the top row. And uh, this is convergence. And everything is connected to one. And so in this way, I feel this is maybe an easier way to understand this algorithm. And uh, there are some properties of this algorithm is, uh, first, uh, it doesn't change the graph connectivity. And second, the extra edges are pruned during iterations. You are removing edges, not adding more edges to the, uh, to the iteration. So you s save some uh, SAFO data. And the uh, iterations may become faster and faster. And then each connected component is end up with a star graph and with all the nodes connecting to the smallest nodes in that connected component. And uh, there are multiple variations of this algorithm in the paper. And uh, the authors uh, just approved one variation has a log, uh, log square uh, uh, complexity and the number of iterations, and it's on the number of nodes. So we picked a variation that just alternating the small star and the big star operations in graph frames because it's uh, easier to implement. And the authors uh, thought this may get a log, just a log n uh, iterations, but um, well, they didn't approve it. And yeah, I tried, but I didn't find the proof either. <laughs> so next, uh, let's talk about implementation a little bit. And um, essentially, well, this map to data frames into some self joins and filters. Think about this. You want to say, find out the bigger neighbors, and then you find out the smallest uh, uh, vertex in the neighborhood and just end up with some self-joins and filters. So we want to make those operations scalable in graph frames. And first is a join, and uh, very likely to be a skill join. Because in graphs, usually, well, it has a very big component, and then, well, the convergence point is a star graph. That means uh, there is a one node connecting to many nodes in that com component, and uh, you may hit a skew, uh, data skewness issue. For example, here, the node ID zero is, uh, has uh, maybe uh, one million uh, neighbors, uh, maybe two million, uh, there's a table. Um, so then uh, we want to join together with uh, data sets, and I don't want to do a hash join because uh, then well, many records on the right uh, table will go to uh, the same partition, and that, that's really bad. Maybe for one million it's fine, but uh, for a bigger number is super bad. So we are doing this join. We split the table, the left table and the right table into two halves. And uh, for the left hand side, we split into high frequency nodes and low frequency nodes. For high fre frequency nodes, we know that uh, there won't be many uh, high frequency nodes if we do a threshold on the degrees of those nodes. And then we do a broadcast join with the right-hand side that corresponding to those high-frequency nodes. And then for the rest of them, we just do a normal hash join, and then we do a union. So in this way, we can handle the skewness uh, pretty well. And it's not a general skew join. It's really just uh, for this uh, application. And then for the iterations, uh, we're doing uh, checkpointing every two iterations 
just to avoid uh, certain things uh, that may happen in Spark. For example, the query plan, because it's a lot of self-joins, and the query plan may grow exponentially large. And it takes, uh, for the, it takes uh, very long for the Spark uh, SQL optimizer to optimize it. And if you keep iterations forever, and you may just uh, end up uh, running out of disk space. And those are just, uh, so this is why we do checkpointing and uh, for this uh, implementation. And let me show some uh, numbers from experiments. And the first one is the Twitter graph, and it has uh, 1.5 billion edges and 42 million nodes. And we run on Databricks with a 16 node cluster. And you saw, well, the number do not look very good because GraphX only took four minutes and GraphFrames took about six minutes on this. And uh, there's some uh, reasons about this. First, there's algorithm difference. So for Twitter Graph, it has a very small diameter. The naive implementation in GraphX can do a pretty good job. And uh, because we imp implemented a different algorithm and that came with some overhead, constant overhead. For example, you want to optimize your query plan and you also need to do checkpointing and uh, you also want to avoid uh, possible skewness, but it, it didn't happen, really happen in this graph. So next one, we did this uh, UK web graph and uh, it has a 100 million vertices and 3.7 billion edges on the same cluster. GraphX this time took 25 minutes and uh, you saw this has a very slow convergence. You saw iterations, 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 and that's because uh, this graph may have uh, just a la much larger diameter. And uh, graph frames in this time only took about 4.5 minutes. And um, yeah, the next one we tried is uh, regular 2D grids. And it's a generated graph. And the signature for this graph is has a really large diameter. It's not really large, but uh, it's uh, definitely much bigger than just normal graphs. And this one has one billion nodes and four billion edges, and we run on a 32 node cluster, and graph frames failed this time because it has run many iterations and then either run off disk space or hit a stack overflow problem. Graph frames took about one hour to finish, and then the biggest one we tried uh, in our experiments is about uh, 10 billion edges. We just increased the graph to 50,000 by 50,000, and uh, graph frames finished in 1.6 hours. So those are the numbers, but uh, we definitely know that uh, there is a lot of space for optimization, and uh, we kind of know while well, there's some inefficient code in our code base, because we used to support both Spark 1.6 and 2.0, we use a common, just the same code to support them and end up with uh, just some inefficient code. But we are going to remove uh, 1.6 support. That means we are going to speed up the implementation by maybe by a factor of two. That's my estimate. And then there are many other things we can try. And uh, like uh, we can just let Spark SQL to handle screw joints if uh, it can do a good job and then we can just uh, clean up our code base. And we can also just say, consider graph compression or just uh, local iterations to accelerate the computation. Yeah, um, yeah, this is my talk. And you can go to uh, the GraphFrames website. It's just called graphframes.github.io. Or you can go to Databricks a user guide and there, can there are some tutorial notebooks there about how to use GraphFrames. And if you want to contribute to graph frames and just go to the GitHub page, and you are definitely welcomed. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Um, if anyone has a question. Yes. Um, how do you define the diameter of a graph? I know you mentioned small yep. and large, so just some more details about that. So it's just uh, the longest distance uh, you can get from one node to the other. If you contin continue all the pairwise distance, right, you pick the largest. And that's the diameter of the graph. But it's very hard. It's also hard to compute that it's just the diameter. So you don't know when you got a graph and the uh, computer doesn't know what's the diameter. And that ma makes it hard to pick an algorithm at, at the beginning. There's, there's also a mic right in the middle um, for any questions.
Um, did you do any comparisons, or do you have any feel for uh, what the what they would look like if you were to implement the same algorithm in GraphX and compare? Uh, sorry, could you repeat our question? Uh, so when you did the comparison, you did the sort of naive implementation in GraphX versus your optimized implementation in Graph Frames. Uh -huh. What would happen if you did the optimized implementation in GraphX? Oh, Did we didn't try, but uh, I can predict the performance, and because um, it may hit the problem when it goes up to something like a billions of nodes, and just because RDD uh, doesn't take a specialized uh, primitive type <laughs> integers, and then you end up creating just millions of objects in JVM, and uh, that will slow down the computation by a lot. Okay, so you think you'd hit memory issues? Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, thanks for the talk. Um, is GraphFrames able to handle graphs where the nodes are of different types that all inherit from a base trait? Um, so currently, you cannot define uh, just uh, arbitrary types. We don't support user-defined types. And, but you can express uh, the meta, just uh, all the nodes uh, metadata in different columns, right? So for example, you have a union of certain type and you can create uh, just multiple columns. And we allow you to just uh, provide arbitrary number of columns as long as you provide the ID. Cool, thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, something about checkpointing and the query optimization. Mm -hmm. I was trying to understand like what was the relationship? What did you see? Uh, so, you know, well, this is uh, something like a self joins, and uh, then while well, you end up with creating uh, a deep tree of, uh, uh, for the query plan, and then that's kind of an exponential growth of the query plan, and you want to cut it off in the middle, right? So the way you can cut off in Spark 2.2, you can just call maybe graph frames dot checkpoint, but uh, well, when we implement this, uh, that feature was not available. And uh, we end up to just, uh, there are two methods to get around it. The first one is convert the graph frames into an RDD. And then that will cut off the query plan. Uh, the other way is just to uh, save the graph out to some external location and uh, for checkpointing. And both works. But uh, even you can convert the data frame into an RDD and you didn't cut the lineage and you may hit the problems on a super large graph, and you may hit the stack overflow problem in Java. So you still need to do some checkpointing or cut the lineage. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay, one last question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so do you have a personal, like, uh, personalized page rank implemented here? I think uh, I saw it in GraphX, but not quite sure about graph frames. Uh, I would say yes, because it's, it's so up here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a parallelized uh, page rank. Uh, check out uh, the latest release, 0 0.5, 0 0.0. Okay, let's all give Xiangyu one round of applause.